Hi, I'm Stephen Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office. Our guest tonight is a phenomenal producer. She's worked on such projects as Infinitely Polar Beer with Mark Ruffalo and Zoe Saldana, The Poker King with Jack Black, Discovery with Robert Redford, Jason Siegel, and Rooney Mara. I want to welcome Erica Hampson to the table here at Double Feature. Hi, Erica. Hi, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Where are you? In New York right now? I'm in my apartment in New York City. Yeah. Well, now, just so the folks know, Eric is originally from Cumberland, Rhode Island. We met um, on Infinitely Polar Beer. Uh, that was being directed by uh, Maya Forbes and her husband, Wally Waladarski. And we forged a friendship. I don't know what year that might have been. Do you know what year that was? Yeah, I mean, I think it was probably 10 years ago. Wow, 10 years ago. And then after that, uh, you worked on the Discovery. Oh, Measure of a Man with Donald Sutherland was another uh, film that you did here. How did you even get involved in the film industry, Erica? Um, you know, I think I was just, I was lucky. I graduated from Boston College and moved to New York with three of my roommates uh, and just you know, happened to to be walking past uh, a production one day where a PA had quit. Uh, I needed a job. They needed an assistant. So I uh, got my foot in the door that way. And then, you know, from there, I uh, learned about this show, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, that was mm -hmm. going to start shooting. So, uh, you know, got a production assistant job on that. And then became Vincent D'Onofrio's personal assistant. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then he decided to write and direct a movie that... Um, that he was going to self-finance and shoot uh, at his property in Kingston, New York, and he let me produce it. And you know, it's a tiny hundred thousand dollar movie that we shot over the course of twelve days. Um, I was in control of the money. <laughs> I figured I'd go back to assisting him after that was over. But I think, as tends to happen a lot in this business, you know, I met people on that set who had a movie that they were going to shoot, you know, in Boston. So then I did that, and then. You know, met someone on that set who had a movie in New York. And so I just, I really fell into it by accident and uh, suddenly was a line producer. When, when you went to, uh, uh, is it BU? Is that where you said you went? BU? BC. Um, BC. Did, were mm -hmm. you studying film at that time or what were you majoring studying, in? Yeah, I was studying communications. Okay. Uh, I wanted to be a writer, but I, I think more along the lines of a journalist yep. than a filmmaker. Uh, but then I, you know, I took a, a film course junior year where we got to write and uh, film and then edit our our own projects and kind of fell in love with it and decided to to make a shift. Oh, wow. And then, you know, this business is so, you know, networking is is so uh, prevalent. And I always thought I, when I was growing up, I always thought networking was, ooh, I don't know. I like to make friends just to make friends, not with any ulterior motive but i realized over time networking is just about making friendships and looking out for each other and if you're like-minded if you're positive energy enthusiastic a team player collaborative responsible good things happen right you get these other opportunities come your way yeah i mean it's, it's really true i think like on every movie set you know i meet a lot of friends, you know, three or four people who I'll probably carry with me uh, for life. And, you know, a lot of those folks um, I get to work with more than once. You know, right. they'll, they'll come to me if they have another another project. So, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, you can network and still make friends like those things can go hand in hand. Right. So when you were um, when you were doing your PA work and, and doing these different things, did you have a long range plan for yourself or are you just trying to figure it out yeah i mean i was just trying to make money and pay rent <laughs> right and, you know um i you know i did know that i liked it enough i mean pa is is really hard you don't you're at the bottom of the food chain you don't make a lot of money you work really long hours and so i think if you can uh do that job and decide that you like it it means you are probably meant to be in this business in some capacity but i i certainly didn't know what i wanted to do um so i i think my career kind of found me so then when you started uh, uh vincent d'onofrio the, actually the first time i ever saw him was a student film at usc um, when i was going to usc film school he was in that film 
and uh, he was a young actor just getting started. Um, when you were in charge of the money, how did that come about? I'm now, I'm the money man or the money woman. Yeah, you know, I think honestly, it's because he trusted me. You know, I've been working with him at that point for a few years. It was his own personal money, you know, $100,000 of his own money. And and so I, I think that was it. It's just he knew that I would do right by him and um, and keep us on budget. And, uh, and I did, you know, I took it very seriously. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't at the time really even understand the difference between like a producer and a line producer. Yep. So uh, I just knew that I, I couldn't go over budget because I didn't want to lose my job. Yep. What about, um, did you have any mentors at all uh, as you were getting involved in the industry? Um, not, you know, not when I was a PA, but when I jumped up to produce his movie, yep. um, you know, I was able to sort of, call, we, we shot it during the hiatus, uh, the summer months, you know, between seasons for Criminal Intent. So mm -hmm. this guy, Mike Smith, who was the first AD and Mary Ray Thulis, she was the uh, line producer, uh, UPM at the time. Like I was able to call them, you know, at any given moment and ask what I now realize are very kind of basic, silly questions, but, you know, they never made me feel stupid and, uh, and would always kind of give me the answer. So I'd hang up with them and then act like I knew what I was talking about to yeah. the crew. And then when I started jumping up, I mean, one of the, the first movies that I did, um, you know, I think it was like a million dollars. It was in Boston. Uh, it was my first union movie. And yeah. Robin Reitman, who's, a, you know, a, an amazing accountant and also from Rhode Island, yeah. she was a, a huge uh, mentor for me because she, she really kind of taught me how to budget. You know, I, I had never used uh, the budgeting software that you're supposed to use for movies. Like she really took me under her wing and, yeah. uh, and taught me a lot of what I know today. Oh, that's great. I, yeah, Robin, I've known since childhood. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Since uh, I remember the first time I met Robin, she was hanging upside down in a tree. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> um, so, so, so you and I met. Uh, you were doing a, producing a movie, Infinitely Polar Beer, mm -hmm. uh, with Mark Ruffalo and Zoe Saldana. It was... Uh, being directed by Maya Forbes, who was an autobiographical story, and her husband, Wally Wolodarski. Um, I think they were co-directing, right? Co-directing that film? No, that one, it was just, I think they maybe co-wrote. She was uh, she was the only credited director, okay. but, you know, I mean, they're a husband-wife team. They're a tandem, I mean, they're yeah. Now, yeah. How, how did you get involved in that show? You know, that was actually... A little bit because of Vincent. Vincent had just done this movie with this company, Paper Street, uh, and then Paper Street paired up with Park Pictures to make right. uh, this movie, Infinitely Polar Bear. And so I think they kind of heard the guys at Paper Street heard my name through him, uh, and they, you know, they put me up for the job. At that point, I knew everyone at Park Pictures. Uh, Sam Bisbee Sam. was one of the producers right. on the the movie that Vincent wrote and directed. Um, so, you know, he kind of vouched for me, and uh, I met Maya and Wally, and we all got along. So I got hired for the job, and I, I think it certainly helped that they were wanting to shoot in Rhode Island, and I was from Rhode Island, yep. uh, even though I was living in New York at the time. So it all kind of came together. And that was a that's a really great film, and. Uh... Well, you guys, that's a story about, um, and Mark played, uh, what was he had? A, he was, um, he had, he was bipolar. Yeah. Uh, bipolar. And it just, in short, it shows really kind of what that can do to a family. Um, you know, and it was, it was done in a very kind of good, sensitive, uh, loving way. And, so, then, in a way. and then Zoe's character was dealing with, um, racial issues and trying to get a job and uh, I, I just thought they did such a wonderful job together and it was like you said it was handled very delicately and nicely and um, I, I really one of the things that I noticed um, having worked with you and working on well, 20 productions just here uh, 20 years of productions here in Rhode Island what I found is that your crew loves working for you or with you, and you create a nice atmosphere and dynamic. But everyone I ever talk to, I love working with Erica. I love working with Erica. That's got to be a nice feeling. Yeah, it, it's a very, it's a very nice feeling. Um, you know, it's certainly better than hearing that people hate me. <laughs> they hate uh, me. 
<laughs> <Other haters. laughs> right. No, I've heard that too for other on other projects. I've heard that on other projects. I'm sure you you know like uh there sometimes a crew will not like uh, a producer. Um and sometimes that that can happen. Um yeah. you've worked with Maya and Wally on uh several films, right? Yeah, we um followed Infinitely Polar Bear up with this movie, The Poker King, which we also shot in Rhode Island. With Jack, uh, with Black. Jack Black. Yeah. Yeah, which was uh, a lot of fun. We based out of Pawtucket, mostly. Yep. Uh, yep. And then they brought me on board this uh, other movie that um, it was called The Good House with Sigourney Weaver, and we shot it up in Nova Scotia. And that Kev was Kevin Klein too. Wasn't he in it as well? Yep. Kevin Klein. Uh, we did it, I think we, like, in the fall before the pandemic. So yeah. I, I know we were trying to bring that movie to Rhode Island, but I didn't have enough tax incentives at the time. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. And we tried to keep it in Massachusetts. They, they really kind of wanted to, to keep it in New England. I think, you know, at that point they had fallen in love with the crew in New England and, and really wanted to bring work back. But it just financially, you know, because of the, the dollar exchange in Canada, it just it kind of didn't work out. The studio sort of said, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, up north. So we did. Are are, are the uh, do you guys have another film lined up uh, with them? Anything upcoming? No, not that I know of. I mean, I you know, I I think they kind of make a movie once every you know three to five years, and so I, I certainly hope. So we're coming up on actually that that time period. I should reach out, but uh, you know, I I would love to work with them again. We would love to have you come back to Rhode Island to work with them as well. I uh, they're uh, Wally's a character. They're such nice people. And yeah. they, they have a nice uh, demeanor about them. Then you also did um, uh, one of the films, The Discovery, uh, with um, uh, Rooney Mara and uh, Robert Redford and Jason Siegel. Who, uh, you know, how was that experience? Can you talk about that a little bit? That experience was probably one of the best that I've ever had in my career, and I I I think the crew would agree as well. It was just one of those really special movies where everyone just kind of came together, uh, had fun, worked really hard, but we really just kind of felt like a film family, you know, and, and we were shooting in Newport in the off season. So I was living in, uh, you know, in, in Newport. It was, it's, I'm never going to complain if I, if I'm being put up by the beach. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, it was like mostly one location. So it was very contained and easy from a production standpoint. It's just, I remember at the wrap party, everyone, and even, you know, a couple of years later, when I when I went back to do another movie, like people would always just say, like, man, that was that was such a great experience. And I don't know, it, it really was like the cast and the crew hung out together. You know, it was I, it was um, I feel very lucky to have to have had that experience because, you know, making movies, it, it's it's hard. So it's uh, especially rewarding when when you can have fun. And that was a net, that became a Netflix movie. Um, and it. it um... Uh, uh, Charlie Mc, uh, McDowell was the director of that, and he's right. the son of um, uh, Mary Steenburgen and Malcolm McDowell. Yeah, um, and the stepson of Ted Danson. So that was also fun because Mary was in the movie. So then, like Ted yeah. was around for part of it with her. So he, you know, Charlie had his family uh, with him, and so yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, well, I remember we had a great screening in uh, at the Jane Pickens Theater. Um, and then you recently did uh, the Whitney Houston film, I Want to Dance with Someone, Somebody. How was yeah. that? That was, that was, I thought you did a phenomenal job on that film. It was big. It was, it was very big. It was by far the biggest movie that I've ever um, produced. You know, so it was big in terms of money, but big in terms of scope yes. as well. You know, a lot of background actors, uh, recreating all of her con concert scenes, uh, you know, visual effects. I mean, for me, it was, uh, it was great. Cause I, I learned a lot on that film and it was, it was a challenging movie. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm proud of it. I think you should be. I remember seeing it and I, I think I either called you or texted you right away. It was really uh, beautifully done. And, uh, I was just in awe, especially at the recreations that, that you had to do, and were you having a uh, to to deal with a lot of uh, uh, research on that? Were you guys having to do a lot of research on how you were going to make things happen? And it was all filmed in in Boston, right? 
It was filmed in in Boston. We had a stage in Quincy Marina Studios, uh, which was you know fantastic to have use of that space. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, there was a lot of research. I mean, I think a lot of people on the movie were at an age where they grew up, you know, listening to her sure. music. So a lot of the crew was already very familiar with her. And and the other thing is that we had Clive Davis and the Houston family on board as producers. So we were able to tap into a lot of, you know, her backstory and ask questions of them, uh, which definitely helped. But I know like Jerry Sullivan, our production designer, he he did a ton of research to be able to accurately recreate, you know, a lot of the the sets and the concert pieces. So he he had a very big job on his hands and he knocked it out of the park. It was just incredible. Um, when you're dealing, a lot of times, Erica, you're dealing uh, on an independent film level, right? As far as um, not all your productions are studio uh, productions. How do you get involved um, as a producer? Are you finding scripts? Are you um, developing projects yourself? Are you a gun for hire? Like, how do you typically get involved in a production? Um, and are there projects you're developing? For the most part, I'm a gun for hire. You okay. know, I'm brought in by a studio or an independent producer once they have a script that's, you know, pretty solid. Uh, sometimes there's already cast attached. Uh, there's always money attached. And then I just kind of come in and, and do my thing. Um, you know, there are a couple of movies that, uh, that I've helped not so much develop, but like been with from the very beginning. I did this movie, Passing, which uh, Rebecca Hall wrote and directed and acted in. And that's a movie that I had been attached to, you know, for years. I met her in Massachusetts on this movie, Tumble Down. Uh, and she was talking about that movie back then. And then, you know, uh, me, Rebecca and Margot Hand, who's a producer, uh, really kind of fought to, to bring it to life. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's probably one of the only examples I could cite. I, I'm not really, um, I'm not really a, you know, developing producer type. Yeah. And so when, when you get a script, tell me, what's the process? You get a script, uh, do, you first, do you get a lot of scripts that are, are, do people say, oh, you're a Hollywood producer, oh, I love, do you get a lot of people submitting scripts or trying to get scripts to you? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who are like trying to get into the industry. And so they'll reach out and ask if I'll read and give advice or if I can kind of point them in the right direction. And then I also do get a lot of scripts from, you know, from yeah, studios yep. that that want either a budget for a movie to know how much it would cost if they wanted to green light it or just, you know, scripts that turn into offers for jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly not so much lately because of, you know, the strike. Right. But uh, yeah, normally uh, in a year where two unions weren't on strike, I, I get probably, you know, four or five scripts a week. And just so you folks know, we probably wouldn't have her on the show because she wouldn't be available. She's usually working all the time. The strike's actually been to our advantage. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, when you're doing a budget, so some films, let's say it was a drama, um, but you don't know who's your cast. Uh, does the cast sometimes drive the, what the budget can be? How, like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think, you know, if there's not cast attached, you sort of make assumptions based on the overall budget that the studio or the financier is wanting you to hit. You know, so if it's a smaller movie, you're just not really going to be able to pay uh, your actors a ton of money, regardless of who they are. Um, so, yeah, and then certainly when actors start getting attached to scripts, if they're very valuable, then oftentimes the studio will say like, okay, you know, we can raise things by a million dollars or, you know, whatever the number is. Right. Um, Cause it's all, you know, it's a, it's a money game. So, yeah. you know, they, depending on how much money they think they're going to make back, which oftentimes is due to the, the cast that's attached, like that determines sort of what I'm trying to back into. When you're, when you're, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's a, uh, a studio executive. He's a vice president of production. And he said, you know, typically we try to get two pages a day. I said, oh, I, I think in the independent world it's a little different. How many pages a day are you trying to get in typically on on an average? On an indie film? Yeah. I mean, it could be anywhere from four 
to mm-hmm. eight. I mean, eight is super aggressive. I would put it more at like four to six. Yep. Um, cause that's the thing. If you don't have a lot of money, then you don't get a lot of days, yeah. you know, a lot of shooting days. And so you're, you're really trying to pack everything in. Um, so yeah. When you're, when you're doing a film on an independent film, are you encouraging using one camera or two cameras? I always budget for two. Um, you know, I think the day can go a lot faster uh, with two cameras. Yep. But then, you know, at that point, I, I sort of leave it up to the director and the first AD and the DP. Like once they start shot listing mm-hmm. uh, and figure out how they're going to cover the scenes, like yep. they let me know if they want to utilize the, the B cam every day or not. Do you find that most of the filmmakers are using one or two cameras typically? I mean, the movies that I do, uh, two is the minimum. I mean, on the Whitney Houston movie, which is, you know, an exception to the rule, I think we had always three cameras going, and there were times that we had five, you know, or five, yeah, for the concert scenes. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I think two cameras is is pretty typical these days. Yeah. Um, are you involved at all in the casting process? Uh, do you get involved in that aspect? I mean, not really in a creative manner. It's more like, you budget. know, if my budget, yeah, if my budget assumes that we're going to hire, you know, that we can only bring in three actors from New York if we're shooting in Rhode Island, like I, everything sort of has to be run by me if they want to go outside of that. Yeah. And then once we decide who we're casting, I'm certainly involved in, you know, helping to make their deals. Yeah. But uh, but I'm not sort of choosing the actors that we're going to put in front of the directors. Right. So, so and, and, and for an audience... Because when you're doing the hiring of an actor who might be from New York and they're coming to Rhode Island, you have to pay them their hotel, a vehicle probably, um, per diem, right? Per week, you're giving them X, huh? X amount of dollars. And what other expenditures do you have? I mean, that's... Those that's, are the ones, right? That's pretty much it, yeah. 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 Um, so are there particular parts of the process that you really do enjoy um, on a production? Is it pre-production, the production itself, post-production, trying to get money? (laughs) Yeah, no. Uh, You know, it's all hard. Uh, I mean, the most enjoyable moment, I think, is, is, you know, when you see the movie at the premiere or on TV and, and you're proud of it and you can sort of justify having spent you know, four or five months of, of your life, um, making the movie. Um, but yeah, it's just, I mean, you know, I don't know, it's not necessarily that I enjoy it, but like I, the prep period is where I devote a lot of my attention. I mean, I I think it's, you know, probably the most important part of, of filmmaking. Um, if you prep a movie correctly, then the shoot is going to go, you know, uh, a lot better for all involved. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's hard work. Now, do you have any particular projects that you love to do? Like, are there, do you prefer a romantic comedy? Do you prefer uh, a drama, suspense? Do you have, are there certain projects that uh, you love more than others or, uh, as far as genre? Or are there certain genres that you're looking forward to doing that you haven't done? Um, no, I mean, I tend, I'm not a rom com person. Like, I, I'm, I don't love, predictable formulaic films um i just like good content you Mm -hmm. know and and these days uh you know the script is obviously very important to me but it's also the people who are involved and where it's going to be shooting like those are kind of the three things that factor into the the projects that i choose to spend my time working on um but like my taste in movies is i I like kind of weird non-linear like memento and you know Go, Donnie Darko, like Stranger kind of films. Yeah. Um, have you had any opportunities to film in any exotic places? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, not so much exotic. I've I've shot in Canada a bunch, Spain, uh, Colombia. Oh. I did a cruise ship movie where we were on a uh, ship for two weeks and we would get off uh, at every sort of port in film. So that was like Haiti, Jamaica. Wow. Uh, you know, a lot of the Caribbean uh, islands. So I guess that's a little exotic. What kind, what kind of crew would you get? Would you would you bring in crew on a, on a produ- production like that? 
Yeah. So there was a, it was a weird movie. We started in New York and we did five weeks here and then we went to Florida and did two days there. Uh, and then we hopped on the ship. And so we like with New York, that was our local crew. And then we took the department heads with us to Florida and then crewed up locally. And then the ship, because it was an actual like operating ship with like 6,000 people who were paying to be on vacation. So we had to be very aware of that. Wow. Uh, we had a really tiny crew. I mean, I think, I think they gave us like 25 rooms and that included the cast. So it was bare bones, uh, but they, it was people that we brought from New York and some of them from Florida actually came, came with us. Wow. What was the name of that film? It was called uh, Like Father, and it's with Kristen Bell and Seth Rogen and Kelsey Grammer. And uh, Seth's wife, Lauren, directed it and wrote it. Oh, wow. And were, were there a lot of looky-loos on your own? You're on a ship, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we got lucky. I mean, lucky is not really the right word, but the, the we got hit by Hurricane Irma. Okay. Uh, we had to actually evacuate uh, and then got onto the ship a couple days late. And because of that, a lot of people canceled their vacation for that first week. So the oh. first week we had our run of the ship. Oh, that's the second true. week everybody came on. And yes, I mean we had to have security with us and you know, there were definitely a lot of uh, a lot of looking news. But yeah. I mean that's, you know, kind of no matter where you shoot a movie, you're always gonna have that. And and would you would you use their dining facilities and all that stuff? Uh, so you knew that you had a a, a nice commissary, so to speak? Yeah, it was sort of, we paid like one price uh, to Royal Caribbean and that included our, you know, our rooms on the ship and it was uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then we shot all over the ship, you know, in a, in a way it's a little bit of a commercial for, for Royal yeah, Caribbean. Yeah, now I want to go on a cruise ship. I'm ready to go. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, what are you working on now? Anything in particular that you've got going on right now? Because I, I know the strike or... Was there anything that you were working on when the strike hit? Um, I mean, I was attached to this uh, movie. It was going to be a sequel to Dirty Dancing with Jennifer Grey that was going to shoot in Atlanta. Uh, and, you know, it needed a rewrite before we could officially go into prep. And it was like just as everyone was talking about the fact that the writers were most likely going to strike. Mm. So the studio hit the pause button. Um, so, I mean, I'm lucky in that I'm still getting asked to do a lot of budgets for studios because I, I think they're wanting to line up content for when everything is resolved yep. with, uh, with SAG. But no, I mean, I, I have a movie that's coming out uh, in a couple weeks called Quiz Lady. Um, Disney Tell us Disney. about it. It's a, it's a, Sandra Oh and Aquafina, Will Ferrell are in it. It's a comedy. Uh, the two ladies play sisters that kind of go on a road trip and um, Aquafina ends up on a Jeopardy-like TV show uh, that Will Ferrell is the the host of, it's kind of like the Alex Trebek character. So it's you know it's good. We shot it in New Orleans uh, oh, wow. maybe like a year and a half ago. Wow. Now, um, what's it like filming, uh, or how is it different? Um, do you have you do you film you you have filmed in New York City? Um, you filmed in you just mentioned New Orleans. You filmed in Rhode Island, Vancouver. Are there differences? Um, uh, when you're doing a production in a different location or are you just in a cocoon? The production is the production. Like, uh, do you feel the differences of the areas that you're making your movies in? Yeah, I mean, there's always sort of a different vibe, you know, to, to every location that I'm shooting at. Um, and there are differences I don't necessarily know in the way that a crew would feel, but like for me, in the way that I have to budget, like each area has different rules, you know, different rates. They kind of do things in their own way. So, yeah. you know, if it's a place that I'm going into that I've never worked at before, I, I usually have to do a little bit of homework to, to get up to speed and kind of know what the lay of the land is there. Yeah. Do you um, have uh, any particular preferences of where you prefer to film? Um, I mean, I love shooting in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. My family, you know, still lives in Cumberland and I have a place in Narragansett. So it's always nice, yeah. you know, to, to feel like I'm, I'm working at home. And then I, I like working in the city, New York City as well, for the same reason. It's nice to sleep in my own bed at night. But, you know, outside of those places, I, I really love Vancouver a lot and I love New Orleans. Those are two of probably my favorite places. to. Have, have you filmed in Atlanta? I haven't. Um, I, the closest I got to it was scouting for that dirty dancing movie. Oh. Um, 
but you know, no, I've never had the opportunity. Yeah. What about, um, do you have any interest in, uh, in directing at all or, or do you want to stay in the producing, uh, area? I think, you know, I've accepted at this point in my career that my strong suit is, is what I'm doing. You know, it's, um, you know, exec producing, line producing, my brain just doesn't really work in a way where I think I would be uh, good as a director. So how so what my... do you what do you mean? I just think that like, I don't know when it comes to like, solving, you know, like a story issue, or, you know, a, a on the day being able to I think maneuver like, you know, if a certain story beat is not working to come up with a different way to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and also just in terms of like the way you have to be able to talk to the actors to get a performance out of them. It's like, that's just sort of not, I like watching people do it well, you know, but like, I don't know that I would have yeah. uh, that skill set. So what, what, I'm, what I'm happy did, where I'm at. what's your favorite part of producing? Um, I think it's just the day-to-day -day solving of of problems and feeling, you know, like a useful part of the the machine. So it's it's always nice to help yeah. the director sort of bring his or her vision to life. And you know, I, I like being one of the people that gets to be in the room doing that. Yeah. Do you um do you typically encourage uh, or not a director to have rehearsals? Um, is it sometimes not even a feasible idea because of your budget constraints. What do, what do you find? Uh, is it is it something that's great? Not great? I find it to be helpful uh, if the director and the cast can get together just to sort of get like the first day jitters out of the way. You know, yeah. before we're going to camera. Um, you know, it helps for them to sort of find their character. I think, and uh, you know, like so a lot of times they want to block ahead of time um so that we're not wasting time on the day so if the director is someone who likes to rehearse i always find room in the budget to make that happen yeah. there i've worked with some directors who have just zero interest in it it's you know they they would rather um be raw and figure it out on the day yeah uh, and then a lot of times it does come down to just actor availability you know a lot of actors are super busy and just can't come, you know, a, a week early to give that time to the production. So um, that oftentimes dictates kind of what we are and are not able to do. Are you the one who would, would, would it be your position or the director's position? Let's say an actor came in uh, and they came in that night and they got fit for wardrobe and they, their hair, whatever. And then they're supposed to start, you know, the next day or the next night. Let's say they came in on a Saturday and they supposed to start on Monday. Mm -hmm. Would you then like encourage the director to take them out to dinner? Would you go out with them? Like what, what would be something that you would think of doing as the producer? Yeah, I think it, it would certainly be, I would encourage the director, you know, to take them out for dinner or a drink just to sort of get a feel for each other. Yeah. Um, especially if they've never worked together or, or met before. Um, I normally do end up having dinner with the cast, but not right out of the gate. You know, it's, we kind of let everybody settle in and then we usually do like a producer director cast uh, dinner once everyone's a bit more comfortable with each other. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And I, you know, I think if an actor's flying in on a, a Saturday night, you know, I'm paying for a bunch of the crew to be working on a Sunday. Cause you, you do want to make sure that they've had their fitting and that hair and makeup has, is looked at them before they're going to camera on Monday. Yeah. And um, do you uh, do you work with particular um, like the, what's tell me about the distribution process? You've done this film. Uh, does it always have a distributor when you start, or is it the are you finding a distributor after? And we're talking about whether it's theatrical or streaming or you know different territories. Uh, international uh domestic can you talk about that a little bit yeah i mean i think that's where you really see the difference between independent films and studio films you know like the the movie that i did in new orleans we knew right from the start that it was going to be theatrical we knew that disney was going to put it out um same thing with the whitney houston movie we knew that sony was putting it out indie movies uh, oftentimes don't have that luxury you know you're you're making a movie uh with the hope that you're going to get into a film festival, that it's going to get attention, that someone's going to want to buy it. And then 
you know, and then put it out on their platform. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a much bigger risk, I think, to make an, an indie movie because there's no guarantee that the world's going to get to see it. Do you get involved at all in the distribution process? Do you try to um, help out earlier on and try to find distribution, or is that not your your your? Thing? Yeah, that's not really my wheelhouse. It's um, you know, I'm I'm certainly still involved with the group that's trying to find the distribution, so I'm always in the know about what's happening. But um, you know, my job is is pretty much like once the movie, uh, once principal photography has wrapped, you know, I, I'm always around to answer questions, but I then sort of hand it off to post-production. Uh, and then, you know, the next time I see everybody is usually at the premiere. Okay, so you're not even, you're not um, following uh, through even uh, with post-production. That's like a post-production supervisor? Correct, yeah. I mean, you know, I made this uh, one movie actually, uh, in Baton Rouge, maybe six months ago. And I'm like a, I wasn't a line producer on that. I was a producer. And so I'm following that through, uh, yeah. like we're about to finish the director's cut and then we're going to be submitting to festivals. So that's kind of, for me, the the rare exception to the rule, but most times I'm turning things over to the post soup. Now who's handling uh, the distribution to uh, a festival? So let's say it goes to post and everything's done. Then, then what would happen? Um, like who's yeah, organizing, it's who's organizing, uh, trying to get them into festivals. It's, it's the, the creative producers, um, or oftentimes the financier of the, the indie movie, you know, they're the ones who are kind of making the phone calls. They're trying to find a sales agent, like they're doing all the legwork to try to get the movie into the festival. Yeah. Like when we, we, we went to Sundance for infinitely polar beer. So was that Maya and Wally's doing, or was that I mean, they had J.J. Abrams was also an executive producer on that? Do you think that was his doing? No, I mean having his name attached to that movie certainly doesn't you know didn't hurt uh, anything. But it was really it was Sam Bisbee and Thea Dunlap who uh, were part of are, are part of Park Pictures, yep. and then the guys at Paper Street. Uh, they also, you know, those two companies combined were doing all the work to get it's it in. A, it's interesting, really, because a lot of people will, will watch a film and they'll see four different producers or three different producers and different companies. And what does this one do? What does this one do? You're mostly dealing with the, the actual filming, right? You're getting that film done. And so it's the quality everybody was hoping for and and then there's another producer that's handling post-production, maybe, and another one handling distribution. Maybe it was another producer that was developing it. That's kind of what we're talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cooks in the in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, you know, it it takes it's there's you know many phases to making a movie. So yeah, I mean, you're right. A lot of people are involved. Yeah. Um, is there anything you would want to share, Erica? You know. You've had so many great experiences with so many really talented people. Uh, anything you would want to share with uh, maybe an audience member who's very interested in being in the film and TV industry? Um, I would say just work really hard. You know, I, I think if you um, if you're a hard worker, somebody is going to notice it and notice the potential in you. And um, if you can get your foot in the door, that's you know. It's really all you need. You can work your way up the ladder. I mean, that's that's the thing that I really do like about this business is that, you know, there is a lot of room for growth for, for people who want to climb, you know, climb higher. So and be and be very right, enthusiastic and responsible, a team player, collaborate, happy. I mean, filmmaking, sometimes the hours are very long and challenging, but you want to be in a foxhole is someone who's pleasant to be around and you can count on right and yeah i think like kindness is so very important you know in this business so i you know just be kind surround yourself with kind people um you have you know a calm calm vibe yeah, yeah well you have you have the calmest vibe and as i said uh people say, i love eric i love working for and with erica and when i would hear that that was like okay because i love working with you too and to hear that from others uh you represent yourself so well your family i know when your mom dad would go down to the set and and they were so proud of you and they're such nice people and um 
I just want to thank you so much for being an outstanding friend, uh, a super talented uh, producer, and really representing the best of our community. And uh, you always leave a location in the same condition or better than when you found it. There's no bad vibes when Erica Hampson is uh, on location. It's all good stuff. So I want to thank you so much for, for all your work. I look forward to the future work that you're going to do. And thank you so much for being on Double Feature tonight. Thanks, Steve. I admire everything you're doing, and I adore you. So thanks for having me. Thank really you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Yep.